This lecture serves as the introduction to state space control systems. In state space control systems, instead of using high order differential equations, the objective is to represent systems using only first order differential equations. And instead of using Laplace transforms, all the analysis is done using linear algebra. This is the introduction to advanced control systems that is typically covered in graduate courses or in electives. We are, however, required to cover this in this course as well. One motivation for the state space formulation is to cover a coupled system of higher order ordinary differential equations, for example those representing the dynamics of mechanical system, to a coupled set of first order differential equations. In a single input, single output case, the state space representation covers a single nth order differential equation into a system of n coupled first order differential equations. This makes the analysis faster and easier. But as opposed to using Laplace transforms, we are going to shift the focus to linear algebra. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to represent differential equations using matrices, obtain a state variable model for a given system, and understand the role of state variables in design problems. This is a fundamental shift from frequency domain back to time domain. The techniques developed in this lecture are applicable to various types of engineering systems such as aerospace, mechanical, electrical, electromechanical, fluid, thermal, biomedical, and economic systems. This is so because such systems can be modeled mathematically by the same types of governing equations. We are not going to formally address modeling in this lecture. We are going to use the principles developed in lecture 2 to come up with time-invariant state equation models of these physical systems and represent them using matrices. This is one example of state space model. How can we determine the future orientation of the space station for a given control action? What needs to be known? We need to know the current state of the system and you need to know the inputs to that system. In other words, how does the input affect the future state of the system given the current state of the system? Here is another example. Consider the step response of the position controller of this robotic arm what parameters influence the transient response and the steady state response of the system? How can we highlight them more explicitly? And how can we find the relation between the current states, the input and the output of the system? First, in order to represent state space variables, we need to define what the state of the system is. A state of the system is defined as the set of variables that provides the future state and the output of the system for a given input. For example, consider a mass spring damper system. The input could be a force applied to that system. In order to predict the output, say the position, one must know the current position of the system and also the current speed of the system. The position and the speed are the current states of the system. The input is the force and the output are the future states, that is in this case position and speed. We can now define a set of variables that will be represented as a vector. And these variables are the states of the system. For example, position, velocity, voltage, and current. Typically, the state variables are the minimum set of variables that are required in order to predict the future behavior of the system given a current input. Let's start with an example. Consider the following mass spring damper system, where u of t is the input, in this case a force, and y of t is the output, say position. What variables we need to know in order to predict the new state of the system when a force u of t is applied? The answer to this type of questions is typically found in the energy stored in the system. In order to predict the future behavior of the system, we need to know the current stored energy in that system. What is stored energy in a mass spring damper system? We have the potential energy is stored in the spring, one half of kx squared, and we have the kinetic energy in the mass, which is one half of m times y dot. Thus, the state variables can be defined as the displacement of the mass and the speed of the mass. These are the elements storing energy into the system. So in order to predict the future behavior of the system, one needs to know the current position and the current speed. A good choice for the state variables are therefore a good choice for the state variables is therefore the position and speed. We can now define the state space vector as x of t. The first entry is x1, the second entry is x2. x1 we can define as the position and x2 is simply the derivative of the position or the speed. So x2 equals to y dot which is the same as x1 dot. Once again, the state variables are x1 equals to y of t, position x2 equals to the derivative of position, that is the speed, which is the same as x1 dot. Once we have defined the state variables, we can go back to the differential equation that describes the dynamic behavior of the system 
and rewrite that equation in terms of the state variables. We are going to use the lowest derivative possible for each variable in order to represent these equations. And remember that the objective here is to use first order differential equations only. Newton's law says that the sum of all forces acting on the mass is equal to m times y double dot. The sum of all forces here are simply the spring force k times y minus friction force that is b times y dot and they act in the opposite direction as u of t. But now applying Newton's law to this system we get the well-known equation for a mass spring damper system here. We can now represent this equation using the state variables that we defined earlier. Remember that our objective is to limit this to first order equations. The first term is m y double dot. In terms of the state variables, this can be described as m times x2 dot. So if x2 equals to y dot, x2 dot equals to y double dot. Why not write m x1 double dot? This is also a valid representation, but now we are dealing again with second order differential equation. And our objective is to limit all this to first order differential equations. Hence, x2 dot is a better choice. Now let's move on to the second term, b times dy dt or y dot. We have two choices here. We can write x1 dot or we can write x2. When you have multiple choices, it is always convenient to go with the lowest derivative. In this case, x2. We have b times x2, which is again, remember, is y dot plus k times y of t and y of t was defined as x1. And this is equal to u of t, the input force. Now that we have the dynamic equation in terms of the state variables, we need an equation for all states and for all the derivative of those states. For example, x1 is known to be y of t, and we know that x1 dot is x2. We also know that x2 equals to x1 dot, as the same equation, but now what is x2 dot? We can find x2 dot by isolating x2 in this equation here. So x2 dot becomes u of t divided by m minus b over m x2 minus k over m x1. And you see that again this is a first order differential equation. And once you have all these equations, you can combine them in a the matrix. We'll see that later, but before we do that, let's look at another example. Now let's shift the focus to an electrical system. Consider the following system where u of t is the input current and v0 is the output. What states do we need to know to predict the new states of the system when a current u of t is applied? Again, the answer to that question is typically found in the energy stored in the system. Which elements in this circuit can store energy? The inductor and the capacitor. The inductor stores energy in the form of a magnetic field, and the energy stored in the inductor is a function of the current through the inductor. The capacitor stores energy in the form of an electrical field, and the energy is a function of the voltage across the capacitor. Hence, a good choice for the state variables are the voltage across the capacitor and the current across the inductor. If you write the equations describing the behavior of this system, this is a second order differential equation. Hence, we'll need two state variables. And those are the current and the voltage as defined. If the system turned out to be a third order differential equation, then you would need three state variables. We can now define the state vector here, x of t, x1 and x2, where x1 is the voltage across the capacitor Vc and x2 is the current across the inductor Il. The output of the system is V0. We can now apply Kirchhoff's law to the system to model it. We can start by specifying the current at node A. The current that we have here is the input current U of t, which is equal to Ic, the current through the capacitor, plus Il. This means that the current through the capacitor is u of t minus i l. The current through the capacitor is also known as the derivative of the voltage across the capacitor. And this is u of t minus i l. And here we see one state variable, the second state variable, and this is the input to the system. This is what gives the first equation. Next, we can do Kirchhoff's law in this loop. The voltage across the inductor is L times d, d I L D T, the derivative of its current. The voltage across the resistor is R times I L. And the voltage drop across the capacitor is negative V C. Negative because the sign of this current is defined as going downwards. And this is equal to zero. Remember that our state variables are I L and V C. 
we now need to define the equations for dil dt and dvc over dt. For this one, we already covered. This is the expression for the derivative. For di dt, we can now use this expression and isolate dil over dt. By rearranging this equation, we get this dil dt equals to vc minus iil. Finally, the output voltage V0 is simply IL, the state one of the state variables, times R. And this is the last expression here. Now that we have all these expressions, we can write them as a function of the state variables. Let's start with the first equation. dV dt is simply x1 dot. We can now write that x1 dot is u of t over c minus IL over c, and IL is x2. Now moving on to the second expression, we have dil dt. This is clearly x2 dot. And x2 dot then becomes negative r over l times il, which is x2, plus vc, which is x1. And the output is simply r times il, which is x2. Now that we have these expressions, we can put them in a standard form for a state space model. And here is the state space equation. We now wish to express these functions as a first order differential equation x equals to x dot equals to a times x plus b times u. x dot is the derivative of x and x is the state vector. a and b are matrices to be determined based on these coefficients and the u is the input to the system. Now let's see how we can write these expressions in this format. Here we have the definition of the state variables and here we have the derivative of the state variables. These two equations are the equations we got in the last step in the previous slide. Remember that x is x1, x2. So x dot is an element wise operation. We have x1 dot, x2 dot. This is equal to a. In this case, a will have to be a two by two matrix. x is again x1, x2. b is a 1 by 2 matrix and you have this times u of t. So now our job is to find these a's and b's. So now let's look at the first equation for x1 dot. Nothing in this expression multiplies x1 dot. So the first cell here is 0. What multiplies x2 dot? x2 dot is multiplied by negative 1 over c right here. If you move on to the second row, now we are looking at x2 dot. What multiplies x1? Well, that is 1 over l right here. That multiplies x1. And what multiplies x2? That's negative r over l. Now we can go to our matrix. Now we can go to the second part of the matrix. In which of these expressions we see the input? Well, the input is only shown here. So clearly for x2 dot, there is no direct relation between x2 dot and u of t. So that term is 0. And the term right above it is 1 over c. So now notice that if we expand this matrix, we'll go back to the exact formulation we had here. And this matrix representation is a representation of dynamic model of the system using only first order differential equations. The first step in this process has the standard form we just saw x dot equals to a times x plus b times u. So this is the relation between the states of the system, their derivative and the input. What about the output of the system? For the output of the system, we need a new set of equations. And in this case, we are going to write the output of the system, which is defined as y, as c times x plus d times u of t. x are the states of the system, u is again the input of the system, and x is the state variable once again. Remember that we define the output of our system to be the voltage across the resistor, that is v0 or il times r, and il being x2, this is the representation of the output voltage. If you now use the standard formulation for the output voltage, y of t is equal to a matrix that to be determined, that is the matrix C times x of t, that is x1, x2. We see that the output is not directly related to x1, it's only a function of x2. So the first element here is 0, and the second element is simply r. And this multiplication recreates this expression here, plus d times u. And you see that u of t does not show up directly in the expression of the output, so d in this case is 0. With these two sets of equations, we can now represent the system entirely using only first order differential equations. The first equation, again, relates the derivative of the states and the states with using these two matrix with the input to the system, 
The second set of equations gives the output of the system given the current state of the system, the input, provided that we know matrices C and D, and those can be obtained from modeling the system. And this is all we need to know for a state space representation. It is now possible to generalize this concept. Once again, these are the two equations we are going to work from. And the first equation is expanded here. X dot is the derivative of the states. And in this case, we have N state variables. And N is the highest order of the differential equations that describe the behavior of the system for a single input, single output system. This is equal to a matrix A, which has dimensions N times N that multiplies the state vector. Here we have the input to the system. If you have M inputs, we have a vector that is one by M and the matrix B that has a dimension n times m, highest order, this is the same dimension as x, and this is the same dimension as u. We can also summarize the steps for analysis. First, derive the differential equations of the system. Then, define the state space variables. There is no single solution to define the state space variables, but a good approach is to always look at the energy in the system and define the set of variables that is sufficient to describe the future behavior of the system given the, the current state and the input. Then rewrite the differential equations in step one using the state variables. Arrange the equations in terms of its own derivatives and form the matrices for both state variables and outputs using the standard form given here. And this is indeed all we have to know in order to represent systems using state space models. The best way to learn this properly is to do some exercises. Let's go to the lightboard and solve them there. Thank you.